This evening on The Rock Newman Show, race, rights, and reparations. The dictionary defines reparations as making amends, payments, and repairs for wrongs and injuries. Tonight, we take an in-depth exploration of reparations and a call for a new design of the reparations concept with my guest, Dr. Kathy Powers from the University of New Mexico and Dr. Nyambi Carter of the Political Science Department here at the Howard University. Race, rights, and reparations. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University right here in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. As long as you've been alive, you've probably heard demands for reparations and redress for the horrific impact of slavery on Americans of African descent. The notion of reparations continues to be sidelined despite the fact that Japanese Americans Native Americans and American Jews have received this consideration, but for black Americans, nothing. In this election cycle, the question of reparations has entered the debate and gone global. We're going to explore the question of reparations and what it should look like in the 21st century with guests Dr. Kathy Powers of the University of New Mexico and Dr. Niambi Carter of the Howard University. Ladies, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for having me. Um, there is a lot to cover. Um, <laughs> before we start covering the subject matter, something exciting has happened over the last over the last two days. Um, uh, you are here from uh, uh, Dr. Powers. You're here from New Mexico right. at Georgetown University. Yes. I mean, you are here at Howard University. Mm -hmm. But the two of you combined your classes over the last couple of nights. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine how dynamic it was. <laughs> Please tell us how that came about and how you felt about the experience. Okay. Well, I should probably say how I, I came to Georgetown. So Georgetown is dealing with the legacy of slavery right now. And part of that, the Department of Government asked me to create a course on transitional justice and reparations globally in the first half and then focusing on the U.S. case in the latter half. So I've been coming here, I'm an adjunct, I have an adjunct appointment, so I've been doing this for about five years. And I have been trying to figure out a way how to connect with Howard on this topic, especially since we're talking about reparations in the United States. During this time, the two chairs of the departments Professor Charles King at the De Department of Government at Georgetown and Professor Clarence Lesane, the chair of the department at Howard, decided that these chairs had never gotten together. In the history of both universities and both departments, mm -hmm. the political science departments had never gotten together, so they had lunch. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is a huge historic moment. What can I do to help facilitate this relationship? Yeah. And so, uh, in the winter, we were actually talking about what we were going to be doing. The two of you. The two of us. Okay. Uh, uh, in our classes, and I was like, well, I have included this whole unit on reparations in my class on public opinion and propaganda, mm -hmm. um, in part because I think the interest is there, at least for me, and this was months before this had kind of reached the national topic, and, and Kathy is doing, Dr. Powers is doing some amazing work with departments of architecture and other about how we memorialize uh, trauma uh, and Holocaust and these kinds of events in her areas in international relations, my area is American politics with the emphasis on black politics. So it was like the perfect sort of synergy at mm -hmm. the moment to bring the two things together. And so this is when our weeks overlapped and so we pulled our classes together this week and it was really great. 
Right. There, there, there are some divine guides. <laughs> exactly. Going, going, because we've been working on this. We've been working on putting this show together right. for, yes. for the better part of six months. Exactly. And it happens to be, to, here we are tonight, mm -hmm. March the 20th, where the issue of reparations has never been as front and center mm -hmm. as it is now in the political mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. So in terms of timing, we're right on time. Right. Exactly. 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 So look, here's something I want to do. I've been correctly accused since birth <laughs> of being extraordinarily literal. And when I read the 13th Amendment, hadn't looked at it in a long time, mm -hmm. but when I read the 13th Amendment that quote unquote freed the slaves, here's what I see. Neither slavery nor involuntarily, involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. Now, I'll just stop right there. Mm -hmm. Because that word, as a literal person, mm -hmm. that word except, not accept, but accept, mm -hmm. scares the hell out of me. And it should. Mm -hmm. I mean. And I want, I want you all <laughs> to weigh in on that. We, we see the effects of it with, with the carceral state that we have now. We see inordinate amounts of black bodies, men and women, in prison, um, over-sentenced, um, penalized. Um, and we know, uh, as political scientists and others in social sciences, the darker you are, the more likely you're to get a harsher sentence, the less sympathetic you are. I mean, even black children aren't seen as children. Let, let, me, let me ask you something. There. You said the darker you mm -hmm. are. Are you speaking of white versus um, uh, uh, brown and black, or are you saying that, for example, a black person of a darker hue mm -hmm. is likely to get a longer sentence, a more severe punishment than someone of a lighter hue? I'm saying both things, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this sort of white, non-white binary in terms of the way we sentence, and then within categories, we know that um, the work of Vessel Weaver and Tracy, uh, gosh, why am I, playing? Tracy Birch, excuse me, uh, at Northwestern has looked at this uh -huh. about the way that juries see uh -huh. darker complected people. Uh -huh. So it is a both and issue. So uh -huh. both people who are not white get sentenced harsher and yeah. those people who are within that category that we call black, the darker they are, the harsher. So judges and juries are looking at skin color and those that skin color that is more towards black than it is towards light or brown or whatever. So within that structure, mm -hmm. the darker skinned African American is likely to get more harsher treatment than his lighter skinned brother. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. William Darity has done some work on this also with respect to the death penalty and mm -hmm. makes a, a similar argument that it applies to who gets the death penalty applied and who doesn't. So it's not just for broadly criminal justice, but now we're talking about the death penalty. That well. is that 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 is fascinating and frankly it's I had not heard it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And scary. That's a yeah. heavy that's mm -hmm. a, it, it, which that's is, a mm -hmm. heavy blow. Absolutely, which is why that mm -hmm. exception in the 13th amendment is essentially laying out why we should be really concerned about incarceration and mass incarceration in particular in our communities because it essentially says the criminal justice system can make you a slave. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and when, when I see this word accept, I couldn't wait to talk to you guys because I wanted to get yes. you all a scholars on this subject matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if I had overreacted, you know, really paying attention to it now and seeing it saying accept because what accept means mm -hmm. is by definition, is that there can be slavery mm -hmm. if you're c punished of a crime. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I mean, we see it with prison industries, right? I mean, they these uh, persons who are in prison are working for pennies, essentially, right? They are getting no time toward, um, or no monies, right, toward their own uh, furnishings and, mm -hmm. and upkeep in mm -hmm. the prison. I mean, we look at sort of that history post-enslavement with using convicts right, and, and for picking cotton and building highways, chain gangs, that history is enmeshed with that clause in that amendment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if we think about the forest fires and the fires mm -hmm. that happened in California. Right. Most recently. Yeah. Right, so in, incarcerated people were used as firefighters and they were paid one dollar a day to risk their lives just as other firefighters. And as climate change continues and we have natural disasters, 
I think this becomes something that is even scarier so, about so, how so, their labor so, so is if, So if we're real about this, mm -hmm. someone putting their life on the line to go into the forest to fight the fire that is destroying lives that could potentially mm -hmm. kill them and they're making one dollar a day, that's ta that is tantamount to slavery. Right, Absolutely. and with no benefits if they're killed, right? And then their families get nothing as other firefighters might get if they so lose their lives. So this should be a 10 alarm fire bell that we set off here. Absolutely, and I mean, and, and, and much respect to the scholars in this area and, and the activists in this area, because they have been talking about this for decades, literally, about the ways in which we use imprisoned people for everything from making chairs to pressing license plates, that it was never a fair system that was going to pay these people a fair wage, which is why we transferred these practices and these, um, these uh, production uh, to prisons and not to um, non-incarcerated citizens. Yeah. Okay, so back to, uh, back specifically to reparations. Mm -hmm. There is something that you don't hear much about and it's called compensated emancipation. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at that as we were preparing, you know, compensated emancipation, well, we find out that the government paid slave owners for mm -hmm. forcing them to free their slaves. Mm -hmm. They paid the slave owner for them mm -hmm. losing their property. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. property, and, it, and it's quoted mm -hmm. for losing their property. The property, of course, are human beings mm -hmm. defined by the Constitution as only three-fifths human. Right. And they got nothing. Exactly. And it's a fundamental tension between property rights and individual human rights. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And this is an exact example what of What do you this. mean when you say that? So when I say that, it's the property rights, the rights of the in, the owners of the enslaved people are seen to have been violated because they've lost their property right. has been outweighed against the human rights of the individuals who lost their freedom and they were enslaved and we've seen this in history so we were talking about this the other night in the debates about the emancipation proclamation and whether or not reparations should be a part of it president lincoln considered should there be reparations for formerly enslaved people or should there be reparations for the slave owners who've lost slave income and their property. And there was such a national debate about it that they did, he did nothing, so it's absent. We've also seen um, when the Haitian Revolution, when Napoleon was ousted, Napoleonic France, mm -hmm. the US, UK, and France said this could never happen again. We have to make sure. So reparations was placed on Haiti, 80% of the GDP, GNP, for 150 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. and the argument was France lost mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. and slave income and mm -hmm. must be compensated. That continues to this day. To this yeah. day, you can't even understand Haiti, why Haiti's the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere without mm -hmm. understanding these reparations that were placed on it. And the Haitian claim today for reparations is grounded in this. Did I hear you say 80% of GDP, <laughs> of, of, of Haiti's GDP? For 150 mm -hmm. years. How do you ever rise from abject poverty, wow. paying 80% uh, of your GDP mm -hmm. to a foreign power. Well, and I think this is part of that, that story, right? This is a penalty, right? So it's not just about compensating property losses to France, <coughs> it's about penalizing Haiti, because what Haiti does is upset this whole order, right? If you are a free black republic in the Western Hemisphere in the United States, uh, Great Britain still have slave owning interests, then you are a danger to our property. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they saw Haiti as at the time. And so this is a penalty for Haitians deigning to do what Americans, right? And the French and the British were talking about, right? About being free, about the right to pursue. Let me ask you, that, th that's, that, that is in your face shackling. That's shackling of a that's shackling of a nation. Absolutely. In your research in this subject matter, has there been anything? Have have you seen any efforts that you believe might try to break that bond? Might try to break those chains? 
between Haiti and, and between France. Haiti's and Haiti and France. There have been some on the international arena uh, talking about the IMF and others stepping in to halt, which is essentially theft, right, of of Haitian transfers of wealth to to France. I don't know how much traction. Yeah. Um, it was able to get, but I know at least it, for a moment there was some conversation, particularly after the earthquakes, the sort of back-to-back -back natural disasters, that mm -hmm. this was essentially going to break uh, the nation of Haiti. Yes, and then also um, the Caribbean countries have come together in a very innovative way to do re use regional organizations to basically pull their sovereignty together, their power together through CARICOM, their regional organization, to pursue reparations for slavery from the UK. Haiti has joined this effort, mm -hmm. and its claim is about France. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the few times, and this is what's happening with Global South countries, period, is using their international organizations as a way to counter the power of the most developed countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So the CARICOM 10 points have diffused across the planet, I should say the diaspora, as saying these are the harms, this is for which we should have reparations, mm -hmm. and it's mobilized not just people in the Caribbean, but African Americans mm -hmm. who are holding conferences about reparations and saying we should follow these points mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So in 1989, 30 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you probably know where I'm going. John Conyers. John Conyers introduced HR uh, HR 40 mm -hmm. with a, re a a request, a respectful, polite mm -hmm. request that Congress study, just simply study, no demand or anything. Let's just study this issue. And for 30 consecutive years, this has been batted down, swatted away, mm -hmm. dealt with in the most condescending nature where it's never been considered. Now, sitting right where you all are sitting now, I had a guest, a senator, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Chris Van Hollen, mm -hmm. who shocked me in stating that it was something that he wanted to try to revive mm -hmm. and, and to introduce. So there's, we've had that 30 year struggle. If you all would opine on what it says about this government that for 30 years there's just been abject refusal to even study the issue? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, um, I think it, it leaves no one, it lets no one off the hook, right? So these are, this has not made it out of committee, whether it was a democratic control mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. or not, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is true for this last 30 years that we've seen changes in power that should have been more hospitable to something like an HR 40, and it hasn't happened. So I think it says something about the sway and the power of white supremacy and a, a, a lack of respect for the dignity right, of, of black people in this country to not even take up the challenge of studying this issue. And that's really all the HR 40 asks for. It doesn't have a price tag right. attached. There are no um, questions about who's guilty and who's not. It just says, let's study the effects of the enslavement Jim Crow periods on mm -hmm. current black life. Mm -hmm. And we have the resources and the wherewithal to do that. And I think the, the idea that even studying it is an affront um, is something that really makes this mm -hmm. issue particularly difficult uh, to reckon with and reconcile because if I'm saying I know that I am hurting and I don't know exactly what the cause is, but I know it has something to do with this other stuff. Mm -hmm. I just need some, this other stuff called slavery. This other stuff, slavery, Jim, Jim Crow, Crow mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. environmental racism, right? Federal policies, mm -hmm. federal housing policy, yeah. all of these things conspired over time mm -hmm. to create the conditions of contemporary black life. But I don't know exactly how to connect those dots. Yeah. This congressional panel would have been able to do that for people mm -hmm. because 
people don't need you to tell them that something is wrong. They know it's wrong. Yeah, they yeah. just don't know how they're to living, articulate it. They're living, they're living the wrong. The wrong. We mm -hmm. can look in D.C. right now and mm -hmm. we can see mm -hmm. where the harm is. Mm -hmm. But people don't really have a language for how to do that. And this would give people a language and the heft and the authority of the congressional um, data collection to be able to make those kinds of claims. And I think we see here that the country is not interested, right? Uh, at least the official bodies of this country, the official institutions are not interested in helping black people be able to do this in a coherent uh, fashion, in a comprehensive fashion. Um, because we can talk about sort of these piecemeal claims that people are making for reparations, mm -hmm. but this is an attempt to do this at a national scale. Mm -hmm. And I think it's clear that we are happy to continue um, kicking this can down the road and leaving it for some other generation. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, Congressman Conyers is now retired and yeah. now Sheila Jackson Lee has taken up the mantle, yeah. but it still is not getting any traction. Yeah. You know, if I could just sure, say, please do. Please say do. really quickly, it is very interesting given the place of the U.S. internationally. So what we're essentially talking about is a truth commission. Mm -hmm. The job of a truth commission is acknowledgement that something happened mm -hmm. and to conduct an official investigation as to the truth of what happened and an official one is conducted by the national government. Mm -hmm. So this proposal precedes the transitional justice movement that's happening across the planet since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. It says in the aftermath of mass human rights violations, mm -hmm. there should be some form of transitional justice, whether it be prosecutions, truth commissions, reparations. Mm -hmm. The United States has led the way in providing the funds for and shaping the authority of truth commissions across the planet. Mm -hmm. So it is a force, and this is the contradiction about the United States, mm -hmm. it is a force for human rights globally. Mm -hmm. So many of these efforts could not have happened without the United States, and yet can't mm -hmm. happen internally. Mm -hmm. HR 40 if should one, have happened if one, look, if one were to look in a dictionary and pull out the word hypocrisy, <laughs> that particular example that you gave would stand out. Mm -hmm. And we could say it across criminal prosecutions for human rights violations, truth commissions, reparations efforts. The mm -hmm. U.S. has put pressure on other governments, has created committees within the, U the U.S. Congress to study other efforts, to put pressure on other governments to pay reparations for human rights violations to their own citizens. Mm -hmm. The State Department has an agency whose job it is to collect data around the planet for the purpose of prosecutions in the future. And yet there's no counter mechanism internally to hold the U.S. accountable. So you're talking about a member of the U.N. Security Council, a permanent member, mm -hmm. has not signed on to the International Criminal Court, can't be held accountable, but has a role in bringing claims. And so one of the things I've been thinking a great deal about is how do you hold, you have to take the United States in its entirety in a sense that it is a major force globally and one of the most difficult countries to hold accountable across issue areas, but especially the African American case. Because historical injustices are just the most difficult cases on the planet. Mm -hmm. So again, sitting in, 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 in the seat where you are, Dr. Claude Anderson, made an alarming, gave an, raised an alarming concern in that he feared that African Americans are on the brink of becoming a permanent mm -hmm. underclass. Mm -hmm. For, first of all, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a deep stretch. Mm -hmm. And if one considers that and the, the cost of that, the cost of that to the country and the, 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 the devaluing of lives that would be amongst that permanent underclass. Mm -hmm. First of all, I mean, the civil unrest that could come from that. Mm -hmm. How, you know, talk to me about you mentioned earlier white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Please talk to me about the contribution of white supremacy mm -hmm. to this very issue. Oh, that's a big one. Well, I mean, I think the thing that happens with white supremacy is it's so normalized in our culture that we do these things that we think um, address racial wrongs, 
but we essentially leave the foundation of white supremacy intact. So what do I mean by that? So we talked about a lot about police violence, right? And the ways in which black communities, Latino communities and others experience that at disproportionate rates. Mm -hmm. So typically what we might see happen, I mean, after some unrest, we might see maybe a civilian commission, right? That's going to investigate uh, these claims, but who gets to be on that commission? Right? Who gets to actually mete out punishment when something wrong happens? So the Civilian Commission is a way to sort of quell um, popular uprising, right? Mm -hmm. But it still leaves foundationally this idea that black people, brown people, and Native American people are the kind of people that should be profiled, are prone to criminality, should be harmed, uh, can be arrested and harassed at any time. I mean, there was just a case out of Las Vegas where a police officer was taking video of people she was arresting and making them do all kinds of humiliating things for her own enjoyment and sending those videos around. And her reply was, well, I was just joking. But that's how it starts, because that mm -hmm. joking mm -hmm. is the same joking that gets Botham John killed in his own house. Yes, that's right? a devaluing, it, 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 it is a devaluing and, and, of white, And I right. think that the, the thing about white supremacy that makes it so pernicious is that we treat it as if um, you know, racism is about individual bad actors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you do something to me that I can call racist and then I can shame you or fire you and that und that undoes the harm and that undoes the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is that police officer exists because there's a whole apparatus that allows her to exist and that apparatus is white supremacy which says anything that you do to violate the rights of somebody that you view as less than human and a criminal mm -hmm. is okay mm -hmm. because they are not white. And I think when you get to that part, this sort of individual level ways of addressing racism yeah. are less than satisfactory. That's why H.R. 40 can go without passage for 30 years, mm -hmm. because we think it's about individual bad actors. And because the Ku Klux Klan is in Bernie Crosses in people's yards, then it's all fixed. So we don't need an H.R. 40, John Conyers. Look at Oprah. Yeah. You know, look at the Michael Jordans of the world. Black yeah. people are doing well. Yeah. But, you know, that is the that is white supremacy at work there, too, because these are good white people mm -hmm. who think that they are doing the right things and are being earnest and are operating on behalf of the best interests of all of us. Mm -hmm. But I think what people don't understand about reparations or any of this, even the study of it, it is about doing what is best for all of us, mm -hmm. because what's good for black people ultimately is going to be good for other communities of people who mm -hmm. find themselves in similar straits. Mm -hmm. And it's really the point I was making about if if it is allowed that an African that the black community becomes mm -hmm. a permanent in the uh, underclass, that is devastating on the entire country. Mm -hmm. It is, but it also is means that white supremacy is working well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is that sort of anti-blackness part of it, right? Is is a key component of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's not enough that that you we're our whiteness. Um, makes us better, it means that it also has to denigrate you as a non-white person. And that's dangerous yeah. uh, for all kinds of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so again, how, again, uh, 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 white supremacy pervades mm -hmm. our thinking. Absolutely. And truly is all pervasive. I have a Facebook friend. <laughs> when I talked about and was mm -hmm. promoting this show, mm -hmm. um, he said that I'm certainly not in, in, I'm paraphrasing, I'm certainly not in favor of any kind of reparations. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay? I'm a taxpayer. I, 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 and this is a black guy. Mm -hmm. right. This is a black guy. Mm -hmm. I'm a taxpayer. I don't want my tax money going to paying for no mm -hmm. reparations. Um, I kind of keep, well, there, there's some other things mm -hmm. he said that I might bring up, but I'll have you to react to that first. Right. So it's interesting that I think first we have to say, what are reparations, mm -hmm. right? So Bernie Sanders is, is bringing up this point. What exactly are we talking about? Yeah. In the American context, there's a very narrow way of looking at it as a fine or compensation mm -hmm. for harm. But more broadly, under international law, reparations is about um, addressing past harms. That can be through restitution, returning what was lost, like a vote taken away, but given back, land taken away, given mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Compensation is a stereotypical way we think about it, mm -hmm. which is money to compensate. If your family was killed, you can, they cannot be returned. Mm -hmm. But rehabilitation is another way of thinking about reparations that's happening in the global south that we don't tend to think about as much here. It is what was the harm and how can we creatively think about how do we address it? So, 
know if you were psychologically impacted, if you had medical harm done, you were attacked. Mm -hmm. In Sierra, Sierra Leone, if your hands were cut off, your feet were cut off, so you can't walk, you can't work, you can't vote, prosthetics are reparations. Education can be reparations, which is what was lost during the time your rights were violated or maybe your children were impacted. Mm -hmm. And so there's a range of ways to think about the functions of reparations that include that are beyond money. And I think the pro part of the problem in our discourse is it's when we talk about it as money, we can't have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to pay. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the broader harm that was done mm -hmm. and identifying then what that means mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about slavery. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the continuous systematic um, brutality from the police mm -hmm. since we got here mm -hmm. till now. Mm -hmm. Ta-Nehisi Coast identified two hundred fifty Connecting the dots harm. between the original slave, catch, slave catchers to the police of Exa the day. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so it's not just this historical injustice that was in the past. Mm -hmm. It created the context for the continuing harms that exist today. Mm -hmm. And we tend to talk about these things separately, but they're all connected. And a lot of the action on reparations actually is police brutality. Mm -hmm. So we've seen Chicago police torture, we've seen our first cases. But to address this individual in particular, it's um, let's have a broader conversation about what c reparations can do. Mm -hmm. Let's think about the harms. Let's think, is money even appropriate? Yeah. In terms of a payment, although money funds all of this, mm -hmm. and to think about what was the harm and how we address it, and maybe people can get beyond, I shouldn't personally have to pay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I was in the car, excuse me, <coughs> I was in the car uh, uh, with, with a driver, um, and the subject came up, mm -hmm. and his focus was, I don't want to hear about money, I, and, and this is a brother also, I don't want to hear about money, I want to hear about treating the psychological, mm -hmm. I want, exactly. we, there needs to be deep, deep understanding of what has caused this, and that we need psychological, more than any, more than any money, we need psychological support. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would agree with uh, Dr. Powers that there can be a portfolio of ways that we can go about this. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be an either or proposition. Mm -hmm. It can be a both and proposition, right? Mm -hmm. We could be talking about actual financial compensation in addition to psychological assistance, in addition to educational assistance, right? It doesn't have to be one thing. It can actually be a number of things. Mm -hmm. But I think before we even get to the money and the help, we need to figure out what is actually going on mm -hmm. in a in a more coherent way. Because mm -hmm. we do know that like black communities are systematically undervalued, their home value. So mm -hmm. as a way of building wealth, homes may not actually be for black people what they mean for other communities. Mm -hmm. But how do we connect that then mm -hmm. to this police brutality piece, to this under education piece? And then and also just as sort of a practical point to this money part that this, your friend raised, um, you already pay for stuff that you don't pay, you don't want to pay for anyway, right? I pay for a war, we pay for a war as taxpayers that we may not believe in. Yeah. We pay reparations to other communities that yeah. we actually didn't harm. Mm -hmm. And this is also sort of implicated in this, what does it mean to be a citizen of a nation that has done these things? Mm -hmm. And how do we as citizens participate in this process? Because once you that money is out of your hand and you're a taxpayer, it goes into a budget. And mm -hmm. how that money gets allocated, we don't have any say over. I certainly, I don't think my grandparents imprisoned any Japanese people, mm -hmm. but their tax money certainly did go mm -hmm. to making those people whole. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we um, would suggest that that shouldn't have happened. What a, this is a this is a huge this is a big mm -hmm. complex complex issue. You know the Canadian uh, American neoconservative David Frum. Mm -hmm. He has his five arguments against repara reparations, and, and, and he introduces it by saying it's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. That okay, so if you do that with African Americans, mm -hmm. and you know the descendants of slaves. Then other people have been disadvantaged also, like women. Mm -hmm. And women might start asking mm -hmm. for that. And Native Americans mm -hmm. might start asking mm -hmm. for that. that, that's, where he, that that's, where he, that's how he introduces it. Mm -hmm. Very early in his five reasons, he talks about, without saying it, the L word, lazy. Mm -hmm. If you should happen to compensate them, it will disincentivize them from working. 
what he didn't say, but you know what he means, mm -hmm. is because they lazy anyhow. <laughs> right. Well, and I think this is the problem with the reparations conversation, particularly as only a money conversation, mm -hmm. is that the assumption is that this is ill-gotten gains, mm -hmm. right? That what black people are doing is profiting off the pain of their ancestors. And I think that is a very short-sighted vision of what reparations could be, but also the real harms that black people face today. You know, black mother, uh, black maternal and infant mortality is not a phantom issue. That's a real issue that's affecting people today. Um, environmental uh, justice is an issue that affects black communities today. I mean, we look at the housing conditions in New York's public housing in Baltimore, Flint, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the water there. I mean, these are things that are happening right now. This doesn't disincentivize, disincentivize anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, people have been working really hard to get ahead and realizing, hey, I may not actually be able to change much about my life given the debt that I'm going to have to incur if I go to college the way people say I'm supposed to, mm -hmm. given that I may be undereducated and may not know how to move if I don't have, say, a good uh, counselor that can show me about college or, or, or scholarship opportunities, trade schools. All of these things are community needs that are happening right now. So to people like David Frum, I mean, if other people have rights claims, they should bring them. Mm -hmm. We should go. I mean, that's what, what we're supposed to do mm -hmm. if we're supposed to be a nation that is ethical mm -hmm. um, and even moral and trying to be a leader globally, then all of these people should make their cases. And if it is a, a just case, then I say, you know, the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's interesting that when you talk to Americans about these issues abroad, right. they can see the human rights violation, mm -hmm. they can see that under law mm -hmm. your rights were violated mm -hmm. and that there should be some sort of reparations. Mm -hmm. Time after time, until we come home. Right. And so everyone's okay with accountability, everyone's okay with making someone else whole until you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it complicated because they take it personally. Mm -hmm. Should I be held accountable? Should I have to do it? What about all these different groups? And then what are the consequences of not? And also these activities are already happening. It's not a question about should these things happen? All of these groups at a subnational level are pursuing reparations in different ways. Native Americans in California courts have some Native American groups, there are about 500 of them. Mm -hmm. Some have gotten reparations mm -hmm. for land that was taken away by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. African Americans through the Deidre Palmer's restitution study group has gone after corporations mm -hmm. for reparations and to look at you could not exist today, for instance, New York Life Insurance, right. if you didn't provide this insurance before. Mm -hmm. The question now is a national effort. Mm -hmm. Can that happen? And what I've seen at least in other countries, it's usually a national moment mm -hmm. where the country says something must be done. Mm -hmm. I get the feeling we may, we have the potential for that right now. You think that we may be inching towards that? At least in terms of it being part of the national discourse in the presidential election mm -hmm. in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. Mm -hmm. That at least we can talk about it mm -hmm. in a way we haven't. Mm -hmm. But it usually in other places has taken a civil war, mm -hmm. hor horrific acts of state repression mm -hmm. for society to say, okay, we have to be something different. We have to go on and we have to do something to show there's a break with the past. Mm -hmm. The question is, will Americans decide we need a break with the past yeah. and we need to address these and, issues? And, 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 and and I would say as we look down on Capitol Hill today and at, the, and at the White House, there is much more of a mindset that is that follows uh, a David Horowitz mm -hmm. who responded to Ta-Nehisi Coates. Mm -hmm. he, Coates made a extraordinarily eloquent mm -hmm. argument mm -hmm. for looking at this and examining this mm -hmm. and giving it a full, um, giving it a full examination mm -hmm. to see what the possibilities are. He did not have and didn't claim to have the cures. Right, right. But one must pull off the scab mm -hmm. to see what the, what's, what's in the sore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I feel there's, there's, there's a much sense on Capitol Hill and again, at the White House, I don't even mm -hmm. think it's, it's really given a thought there. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that what he says in a simplistic manner, uh, Horowitz, there isn't one particular group that benefited from slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, that may well be in disingenuous. I'm going to have you guys respond. <laughs> mm -hmm. There isn't one group that was solely responsible mm -hmm. for slavery. Mm -hmm. 
Only a small percentage of whites owned slaves and many gave their lives fighting for free slaves. So, you know, you mm -hmm. put that out in its sound bite mm -hmm. and folks who are in place to make decisions mm -hmm. about this, that's what they parrot instead of taking the deep dive that, you're, that you all mm -hmm. are suggesting mm -hmm. that is necessary. Right. Yeah. But, okay. Okay, so I was gonna say, okay, so not only did individuals own enslaved people, families, but white institutions, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And so it was institutionalized in the fabric of society, in the economy, in the political system, in the university system. I mean, this is what Georgetown is dealing with right now. I, ju I just wrote right? Ivy <laughs> League and I wanted to come to yeah, you exactly. to talk about the role of institutions of higher learning. Exactly. Especially Ivy League. And you mentioned at the outset that Georgetown was examining, examining the legacy. Right. I'd like for you to define that for us. What does that so, mean? Sure. So it's not that it was a recently discovered issue. Mm -hmm. It was a function of student activists who were influenced by the protest about monu Civil War monuments. Mm -hmm. And they said, these buildings who are named after past presidents who owned enslaved people, we cannot live in them and we cannot have this. <coughs> and they facilitated a multicultural student response mm -hmm. that required that the university pay attention because it was connected to a larger national movement. Mm -hmm. So this is really important. It's not the students didn't protest. It was a moment mm -hmm. where they could get attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so when Georgetown decided that it was time to do something about this and acknowledge it, it created a working group mm -hmm. that served the function of a truth commission. Mm -hmm. And it was composed of faculty, staff, students, alumni, I think, from Georgetown. And they conducted, I think, a year-long investigation as to the truth of what happened, mm -hmm. that Georgetown owned, um, had its own plantation. Mm -hmm. It owned 272 individuals. Mm -hmm. um, when the university was going to go under financially, they sold these individuals to plantations in Louisiana in mm -hmm. order to save the university. Mm -hmm. Because the Jesuits kept very fine documentation, right. very fine documentation. They had information on the individuals, they had their names, they had descriptions. Mm -hmm. So then alumni said, okay, but... So here's this property. Mm -hmm. Here's this property that, that, that the university owns. The university is making a financial decision to liquidate that property exactly in order to stay afloat exactly. in order to survive so georgetown university and ivy league schools this, and georgetown is not by itself exactly at all exactly but they exist today exactly. in part as a result of making those financial decisions that these human beings that they sold allowed them to stay in business. Exactly. When one looks at that, one then has to say, it's, it, it, it sounds to me like it would, it would be intellectually, intellectually impure mm -hmm. to ever put forth an argument that if slavery allowed that, for you to survive, that there is not, that you don't bear some responsibility and accountability for addressing your wrong. Exactly. And I think this is what the hard part about all of this, right? So individuals didn't have to benefit from slavery, but you as a white person who was defined essentially by your skin color as yeah. a non-slave person uh -huh. benefited that by not having That could go to that school that's just saved Absolutely. itself. And, uh, and then this also too, by claiming this identity as a Georgetown Hoyer or an American. Mm -hmm. What is our responsibility then? Because you can't stand on that legacy and only claim the good parts, mm -hmm. right? We can't mm -hmm. just take the basketball team and the Hoyer and mm -hmm. we can't just take the flag and, the, and, and all of the sort of core principles and not address the fact that in our founding documents, it did define black people as three-fifths human, the fact that it did allow for the importation of slavery. I don't care if those portions have been amended. It's in the document. Yeah. The fact that we did allow for enslavement to occur in this country, for Jim Crow to occur in this country, and all of this happened, we can't get to say that we're Americans and all this stuff that happened before us, Native American removal, Japanese internment, we bear no responsibility yeah. for that. Yeah. That's not how 
national identities work. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly not how responsibility work. And this is where the transitional justice folks have been really important in helping us see that when you claim an identity, a national identity or university identity, you claim all of that legacy. Right. And that not to do so is, is, is just simply intellectually dishonest. dishonest. It, absolutely, mm. to your point. And I think that's the hard part because that requires us to be responsible then mm -hmm. for all of the other stuff mm -hmm. that our nation did in our name or our school did in our name. Right. They might not have known, right, yeah. when they applied that the Jesuits owned and enslaved yeah. people and sold them down the river, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. um, but once you go to that school and you want to be able to say, I'm a Georgetown Hoya and this is my gotta, alumni you gotta community, take it all. you got to take it all. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. And that's for black students, white students, Asian students, and everybody mm -hmm. else at that school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're having internal debates about this. I mean, what the university has said is, and it's part of acknowledgement that it was going to transform itself. This is yeah. called transformative justice, mm -hmm. that the institution itself is responsible. So what they're saying is, we're gonna create a center for the study of slavery, a racial, a race and social justice institute in the law school, mm -hmm. that we're gonna become the place where you come to study this. Mm -hmm. But there's also the descendants of the 272 mm -hmm. individuals, there's yeah. 6,000 of them. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to say, okay, what does this look like for us? Yeah. So at the beginning, yeah. Georgetown was thinking about reparations, truth commissions, without consulting the descendants. Mm -hmm. And the descendants said, but wait, we should be a part of this mm -hmm. process about mm -hmm. what this looks like. And for them, you know, everyone thinks that the descendants got free tuition. They yeah. didn't. Right preferential consideration at admission comparable to alumni. Mm -hmm. And so some of them said, but wait, what if we don't want to go to Georgetown? Sure. Sure. So now what they're thinking about, which is reflective of what's happening elsewhere, is economic development. Mm -hmm. Where are there concentrations of descendant families in Maryland, in Virginia, in Louisiana, mm -hmm. who are impoverished as a function of this legacy? Mm -hmm. And can Georgetown think about economic development mm -hmm. in those areas to deal with the broad broader implications of having done this. And then among the student population, they're having this debate about, you know, if there was, they're, they're debating a, a student fund. Mm -hmm. And so should the students have a fee that they pay every year? Mm -hmm. This is a, a faction of the descendants is proposing that mm -hmm. students pay a fee, that money yeah. goes into a fund that then provides reparations of some kind. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of conversations we're having about identity, mm -hmm. am I responsible or not? are happening in this microcosm. Mm -hmm. which is so really so some of the some of the Ivy League schools have apologized. Yes. Who do you feel has been most progressive, if anybody, <laughs> after the apology? Because I mean the apology sounds good. Mm-hmm. Well, How much do you mean it? Well you know to 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 be fair, I haven't studied all of them. But I will say, to my mind, Georgetown right now yeah. is mm -hmm. technically doing the most. I mean, if you go, it's not hidden. Mm -hmm. When you go to their landing page, it is a part of who they are now claiming to be as an identity. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole section about what that university was when mm -hmm. it was in the slave owning business mm -hmm. um, or the black people owning business, mm -hmm. um, the plantation, all of that stuff is public. And I think when we think about, I think, are you thinking about like the Brown case mm -hmm. and some others where it's been less discussed? I mean, UVA talks about Monticello all the time, mm -hmm. but there's not been a real recognition of what happened on that hill, right? People were making nails and bricks and things for them to sell, yeah. right? These were people who were enriching um, that place and allowed UVA as a university to be a thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they've addressed it beyond saying, oh, you know, these people were here and they were important to us and I guess for some acknowledging that is enough, but I don't know, and I'm not trying to, to call anybody out in particular, mm -hmm. but I mean, this is a place that has a very identifiable enslavement lineage, and I don't know that they have taken necessarily the steps um, to a, at least attempt at trying to make people whole, mm -hmm. which I think is what reparations is attempting to do. Mm -hmm. right. In and I would say there's also, there are other universities addressing this, but they have different legacies of violence. Mm -hmm. So the University of New Mexico is a very complicated history. In mm -hmm. the Southwest, you have the settler history, the Hispanic Latinx history, and then you also have indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And so the University of New Mexico is dealing with a broad range 
of issues. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the anthropology department um, had historically taken artifacts from Native Americans, dug up graves and taken artifacts and then put it all in the museum. Mm -hmm. One of them was a totem pole mm -hmm. from a tribe in British Columbia. And um, Les Field, who's the chair of the department now, said we should start to return these things and contacted the tribe mm -hmm. and negotiated what restorative justice looks like in their cultural context. Mm -hmm. And it was, we can't take that totem pole, it's tainted. We want to do a ceremony to cleanse it mm -hmm. and then repair it and give it to the artist family, mm -hmm. make a replica and give it back to us. Mm -hmm. And so these discussions are happening across the country. Mm -hmm. I think what we tend to know about is what's happening with the legacy of slavery in Ivy League schools. I'll say, um, I know Yale, I think, allocated $50 million towards hiring more faculty, staff, to get more students on campus. Mm -hmm. I think Georgetown is trying to think about institutions that can be created. There's also the criticism, are you? Are these institutions really helping or addressing the legacy of violence and helping the descendants and African American students? Is it creating a new reputation? Mm -hmm. Will Georgetown benefit from it? Mm -hmm. And so you can see the discussion on both sides, although I think it's been the most active at doing it. I was brought in specifically, I think transitional justice in universities is a course mm -hmm. that allows students to think about it, to discuss it, to contend with it without having to be in the media. Mm -hmm. And so Georgetown was one of the first to create this class. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would say, I, I would say, I think it's very progressive there, but the, the issues are sort of vary. So mm -hmm. let's take the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. right? So they were thinking about, they had the technology to x-ray the ground and see layers and layers and layers of bodies, mm -hmm. knowing that they yeah. were enslaved people. Yeah. So their debate is about memorialization mm -hmm. and less about reparations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what is the narrative? What should it look like? Mm -hmm. And so we also have memorialization being debated, not just reparations. So, so, so I'm thinking right now, mm -hmm. Slavery is considered America's original sin. Racism in 2019 continues to be America's mortal sin. Mm -hmm. It has the potential to destroy this country. So that if institutions of higher learning, where there is supposed to be the higher level of integrity and ethics. If they don't really look within, mm -hmm. and this mortal sin is not gonna be changed or forgiven if there's not a purging mm -hmm. and a true sense of acknowledging mm -hmm. how you have been accountable every step of the process, mm -hmm. how you've benefited, how you've exploited. So in the three and a half minutes or so we have left here, I want you to, who have studied this, you know, to speak to institutions, whether it's insurance companies, mm -hmm. whether it's institutions of higher learning, Wall Street mm -hmm. and the rest, about how and what, how they should look inward to help to help correct this mortal sin that if they don't, might destroy the country. That's a big one. Um, so my first stab at this would say, I think in the case of reparations, like guilt and shame are useless emotions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They will get us nowhere. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a hard process of excavation, not necessarily because the records aren't there. They are in many cases. Institutions keep really great records, mm -hmm. particularly universities. I like that term, excavation. Yeah, excavation. But, but it's going to be hard mm -hmm. because not only is it going to cost you something financially, I think that will probably be the easiest thing to part with, mm -hmm. but it's also going to cost you something psychically into who your identity is, right? Potentially. Mm -hmm about who you think you are. Yeah. And I think that's the real hard part. And I think that's what scares people. But I think on the other side of that mm -hmm. is being on the side of justice and justice, doing the right thing. Which is liberating. Absolutely. And I think everybody can, can profit from that literally, mm -hmm. not just in terms of money, but also spiritually and psychically and emotionally mm -hmm. from doing the right thing. And mm -hmm. it's always the time to do the right thing. It's mm -hmm. not convenient, but it's still right at the end of the day. And I think that's that has to be the focus and less on the money, less on who gets what and who did what, but 
what happened and what can we do now? Because that's the only thing we can control. We're going to try to do everything we can to make everybody see this television. <laughs> right I think it's great. Um, so I would say HR 40 is very important for this reason. I think that we first have to begin with what happened and what are the harms that were created from it. That has to happen first mm -hmm. because we have the harms not just that happen at that time, mm -hmm. but exist to today. Exactly, right. and mm -hmm. show the connections between them. I think that's the first thing that has to happen. Mm -hmm. I think. I think secondly, we have to have a conversation about what are our options, including reparations. Mm -hmm. So we haven't. We framed this that reparations is the only route. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a range of other things that we can think about, institutional reforms, mm -hmm. like this is happening in some of the police brutality cases. It's, mm -hmm. it's in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, it's not reparations for police shootings, but it's reforming the police and training. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the appropriate approach. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's, there are a range of options. I think reparations is definitely necessary, but I think what we have to do to uh, deal with the contentious politics that will arise, not only between African Americans and the rest of society, mm -hmm. but within the African American group as well sure. about whether or not it should be pursued, mm -hmm. is to understand the harms then, the harms today, and then how could reparations creatively mm -hmm. be constructed to address the particular harm. You guys were absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Folks, that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Thank you for tuning in. God bless, and we'll see you the next time. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.